welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out in an absolutely uh, deplorable uh, weather. Um, it's uh, terrific that uh, you could come here. I'm sure you're going to uh, like the uh, like like today's talk. Uh, I know I'm excited. Uh, my name's David Figlio. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Research, which is the sponsor of this distinguished lecture. For those of you who don't know about IPR, IPR is the organization on campus and our job that um, brings together people from all different types of social sciences, medicine, education, et cetera, um, to try to study the world's most intractable social problems and uh, come up with policy solutions test them out and study what happens there. Uh, it's really um, uh, a delight to be uh, the colleague of so many gifted scholars, uh, many of whom are in attendance today. If this is your first IPR event, I encourage it not to be your last. And uh, uh, I hope that you'll um, uh, send an email to IPR at Northwestern.edu in order to um, get on our um, get on our mailing list. After the talk today, we have a um, some wine and cheese reception. I encourage you to stick around and mingle uh, around the room or a few easels with some infographics of various IPR uh, research uh, of late. And maybe you'll learn about some other research that's exciting that we're doing here as well. Um, I am thrilled to introduce Andrew Churlin. He's a sociologist at Johns Hopkins, uh, my hometown of Baltimore, um, since he uh, earned his PhD at UCLA in 1976. Uh, Andy has a mile-long resume, and all of it is uh, all of it is extremely substantial. So I won't go through very much of it. Um, I will say that he has previously served as the president of the Population Association of America. He received the Distinguished Career Award from the American Sociological Association. Just recently, he was elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences this year. Congratulations. Um, uh, Andy is an expert in many aspects of uh, marriage and the family and has done path-breaking work on a wide range of uh, topics, documenting the changing nature of the American family and its interaction with economic and social currents. Um, his highly esteemed books include um, uh, The Marriage Go-Round, The State of Marriage and the Family in America Today, uh, Labor's Love Lost, I love that title, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Working Class Family in America. Uh, in addition to his high-profile scholarship, uh, Andy is a frequent contributor to the public discourse on marriage and the family and the economy, and he often uh, we often see his exciting work in the New York Times op-ed page. And in fact, I remember when we in invited him uh, was uh, uh, last year, there was just this really amazing New York Times op-ed, and I, I, I remember a group of us got together and said, we have to invite him. So I think, I don't know, 45 minutes after that came, an in invitation went out to Andy. Um, I think you'll uh, be extremely excited, to, as I am, to hear uh, what could be more topical than the conversation we're having right now in America than the economy, the family, and working class discontent. So please join me in welcoming Andy Cherlin. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, David. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here at Northwestern and. Uh, at the Institute for Policy Research, which has done so much terrific research over the years, has a such great faculty and students, and so many of us in other universities have collaborated with IPR, as I have, uh, and know how strong and how important it has been in the policy field. So I'm very pleased to be here. I want to talk with you about the economy, the family, and working class dissent, uh, and um, how we can understand uh, some of the support that we're seeing for Trump among the working class. Um, this is topic one, as David said, over, although perhaps in Cleveland and Chicago is topic two, um, but it's topic one elsewhere. And what we're seeing in this election is a huge educational divide among whites in support for, for, for Secretary Clinton versus Mr. Trump. Uh, you all know this. Let me just show you one chart. Among um, people without a college degree, whites without a college degree, in August, this is measured in August, there's a two to one ratio of support for Trump 
to support for Clinton. Now, by a college degree, I mean a bachelor's degree, a BS, a BA, something that's often called a four-year degree, although a lot of people take five or six years these days to do what's supposed to be a four-year degree. But that's what I mean. That's, that's, that's what I mean by a college degree, uh, not just a couple of years and not just an, an associate's degree. For um, people with a college degree among whites, uh, almost the opposite, a big uh, increase in support for Clinton. How can we understand this? I think we can if we think hard about what's happened to the working class over the last few decades um, and what and how they view the way their lives are going. Let me talk about that for a bit. Um, there have been a number of books that have come out just recently on this topic. There's a book called White Trash, a 400-year untold history of class in America. It's on the bestseller list, or at least was last month. It's a history book. It's really about poor whites. But there's another one called Hillbilly Elegy. Some of you might read, might have read by a guy who grew up in Appalachia, is now a venture capitalist, um, uh, writes for the National uh, Review, and writes about the culture and economy of growing up in the uh, in, in Appalachia. Arlie Hochschild, a sociologist, was just nominated for a National Book Award a week or two ago for a new book called Strangers in Their Own Land. Very interesting book where this Berkeley sociologist takes repeated trips down to Louisiana to try to understand the Tea Party, small government, anti-government people that are very far from her political views. And she manages, I think, to encapsulate very nicely what it is about their lives um, that's that's most interesting and most important in their stories. So a number of books have been have attempted to um, unravel this puzzle, um, and uh, but the attention to the non to the white working class really spiked last fall when there was an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Anne Case and Angus Deaton. Rising morbidity and mortality in midlife among white non-Hispanic Americans in the 21st century. So morbidity, illness, and mortality death rates are rising, they claimed, for whites currently, which is a substantial reversal from the decline in death rates we've seen for almost every group in this country for decades and decades now. And the decline was greatest for those with less than a college degree. And what was calling the, causing the, the, I'm sorry, the rise in mortality was greatest for those with, with less than a college degree. What was causing it? Increases in overdoses, drug overdoses, alcohol poisoning, cirrhosis of the liver, suicide. So a spike in self-destructive and sometimes suicidal behavior among less educated whites leading to strikingly higher death rates. Now, they may have, it turns out, have exaggerated this a bit, but it's still an important phenomenon. Here is charts about death rates since 1999 that the New York Times published a couple of years later, um, a couple of months later, rather. Um, and they show that the rates were going up for women. If you look at the red lines on the, on the left-hand side of this chart, you'll see that for white women, most of the lines go up, meaning death rates really were going up for white women. They were going down for the oldest white women. For white men, the blue lines show death rates were going up for the youngest, kind of steady for the middle, going down a bit for the, for the oldest. But those rates for white men, even if they show stability, it's still terrible. Let me show you what the graphs for blacks and Hispanics look like. Look at that. Okay? Look how sharply death rates have been going down for blacks and Hispanics at every age group and then look back at whites. So even if we may only say that death rates, death rates are stable for whites, that's a terrible outcome. So clearly something is going on that's causing this self-destructive behavior among the, what we might call the white working class. Um, I'm going to use working class in this talk. Some people might argue we don't have a working class anymore. Um, it's a term, however, that seems to make some sense to everybody. Sometimes in the book I write, I talk about today's would-be working class, the people who would be taking the working class jobs that we used to have if they could find them. And I'm going to define them as people without a college degree. Why? Because that is the marker in our society that I think divides the winners and the losers in globalization, as I'll talk about. Um, and so um, in this working class, discontent and self-destructive behavior, can we connect it up to, to support for Donald Trump? I think we can. 
Recently, a, a working paper came out uh, by a man named Jonathan Rothwell at, at the Gallup um, uh, organization explaining political views of the case of Donald Trump. He took daily tracking polls for the last year from Gallup, 87,000 people, in which every day this group of people, which accumulated to 87,000, was asked, do you hold a favorable view of Donald Trump? Well, he found that those with a favorable view were less educated, makes some sense. They were more likely to be in blue-collar blue occupations. They reported economic distress, but he said not lower incomes. In fact, they had, he said they had surprisingly high incomes given their education levels, these Trump supporters. Yes, they were supporting distress, but incomes weren't as low as you might think. He was very puzzled by that. I think I can explain that. Okay, I think I can explain that because asking about somebody's income, I will argue, is not the best measure today of determining how they feel about their lives. It's part of it, but it's not the whole story. To get to the whole story, I want to talk with something I'll call reference group theory. This is theory put out by a man named Robert K. Merton, who was at Columbia in the middle of the 20th century. He's one of the great sociologists of his time. Um, his book, Social Theory and Social Structure, has many interesting insights. Reference group theory is not really a theory in the scientific sense. It's more of a perceptive observation. And he was a perceptive observer. And basically what he said in a nutshell is, people's views depend on who they are comparing themselves to, that is their reference group. And one must know one's reference group before one decides whether or not um, you have measured accurately what's going on in their lives. So um, let, me, let me illustrate this by saying, I think that today's adults, when they think about how their lives are going, their reference group is their families when they were growing up. That is to say, I think we form expectations when we're growing up of what life should be like, what it was like, we look at our parents and what they were doing, and we tend to compare ourselves with them later on. We know, for example, of studies of the amazing generation that, that was born during the Great Depression. We know from studies that, that years later, after the Depression and World War II, the effects of the Depression still stood with them. And according to sociologist Glenn Elder, they had a very modest material expectations because of growing up in the Depression, and they were wildly happy with what we'd say today were small, single-family homes with a, a, a clothesline out back and one car. To them, compared to the Depression, that was great. Their reference group was their parents growing up in the Depression. The 50s were great compared to that. Today, however, when one looks back at how one's parents are doing, you get a different story based on whether your parents really, whether you have a college education or not. If you grow up in a family with a high school educated dad and mom, um, they were probably doing pretty well. Um, dad at least probably had a decent job, perhaps an industrial job, perhaps even a unionized job, making a decent amount of money. Um, but today, as a high school educated young adult, you may not be able to do that. Um, we, we talked to some men who illustrated this in this book, Labor's Love Lost, with apologies to Shakespeare, that I did write a couple of years ago. And let me give you a couple examples of what, what uh, young men said when we talked to them. These are young men without college degrees. I talked to a white man in Chicago, and he said, so things have definitely changed. It's much harder for me than it was for my father. My dad, when he was 35, he tells me, I had a house. I had five kids or four kids. You know, look where I was at. And I'm like, well, Dad, things have changed. We talked to many white working class men like that. Here's an interview with a black man in Boston. He said, I think there are better opportunities now because, first of all, the economy is changing. The color barrier is not as harsh as it was back then. I mean, you know, yeah, I think things are changing and getting better. Now, this man and the other black men we we're talking to are not saying that life is great. They're not saying there's no discrimination, but they're comparing themselves to, when the, to the color bar and their parents' experiences a generation ago, and they see progress, and they think life is better. The irony here is that the white working class guys were earning much more, much more on average than the black working class guys. It's very likely that this white man that we talked to had a higher wage than the black man we talked to, 
But the white man was unhappy, the black man was happier. Reference group theory then explains why people who have more objectively may still think they have less, and why people who have less objectively may still think why they have more. And it explains to me why uh, the Gallup person finds that uh, the people who are reporting economic distress are not necessarily the people with the lowest incomes. That's right. They're probably more likely to be white than black, for example, and have somewhat higher wages. But when they compare themselves, they see that life is not as good as they expected it to be based on what was happening in their lives when they were growing up. Um, so we can explore this a bit more. This thesis of mine, which is it's not just income, but it's income relative to your reference group that matters. Um, we can explore it because of some questions asked in the general social survey. This is a biennial survey done by uh, NORC at the University of Chicago. NORC used to call themselves the National Opinion Research Center. Now they call themselves NORC, just like the Tribune co company now calls itself Trunk. What is it with names in Chicago? Can someone explain this to me after the, after the, uh, the lecture is over? So NORC asks the following questions every time it does its survey. Compared to your parents when you were the age you are now, do you think your standard of living is much better, somewhat better, about the same, somewhat worse, or much worse than theirs? And here are the responses from non-Hispanic whites. Uh, of labor force age in the most recent survey, which was in 2014. 53% they're doing said they're doing better. 27% said they're doing the same. 20% said they're doing worse. Now, I think that 20% is an underestimate because I think it's really embarrassing to admit to an interviewer that you're doing worse than your parents. So there is a wide distribution here among these non-college educated whites in their response to this question. And I think that distribution will map onto people's attitudes toward the various issues that the Trump campaign brought to the fore this year. Let me show you though the change over time in responses to that. This has changed from 2000 to 2014 in the percent of people responding that their standard of living is better or somewhat better than their parents for three groups, Hispanics, Blacks, Whites, okay? Um, without college degrees. I'm showing you a line there for Hispanic. And it is in every, in, in every year, the percentage who say they're doing better than their parents is pretty high. It's in the 70s and 80s. Might go down slightly, bounces around a lot. You know, it's pretty stable and pretty high. Here's the same line for Black non-Hispanics. It starts low, if anything, it's slightly higher at the end. Uh, here again, you know, it's more or less stable, not much of a trend, uh, certainly no decline, bounces around. So for blacks and Hispanics over time, there's not a lot of change in their responses in the general social survey to this question, uh, do you think you're doing better than your parents? Here are non-Hispanic whites. They start the same as blacks and Hispanics and they dive bomb. So between 2000 and 2014, an increasing number of the working class whites, if we can use that term, a decreasing number were saying they're doing better. So fewer and fewer of them are saying they're doing better as we get closer to the 2016 election. So who are these worse off whites? Sometimes I call them the downwardly mobile. They are the people at least who think they're downwardly mobile. I can't actually measure their parents' income, but I think the relevant the point is whether they think they're doing better or worse than their parents. So who are the ones who think they're downwardly mobile? Well, when you ask them about their social class, uh, if we compare the better off and the worse off, the better off whites um, say the largest bar there is for working class, but a substantial number say they're middle class, and very few say they're lower class. When you ask the same question of the people who say, I'm doing worse than my parents, Here's what it looks like. Once again, working class is the highest bar, but far fewer of them say they're middle class, and 22% of them say that they are lower class. Now, I'm stunned by that number, because in national surveys, almost no one wants to admit to an interviewer that they're lower class. And when these questions are asked, you get one, two, three, four, five percent of people saying they're lower class, because it just doesn't sound right. 22% of these people told a stranger, that they were lower class. They see themselves as doing worse than the people who say they're better off, the people who think they're upwardly mobile. 
So they're more likely to identify as lower class, they're less likely to identify as middle class than are the better off. Also, the people who say they're doing worse, who think they're downwardly mobile, report lots of economic disadvantage. They're less likely to have worked 50 or more weeks. The better off, 48%. The worse off, 63%. I'm leaving out the middle group. They're more likely to have been unemployed in the last 10 years. They're more likely to have earned less than 25,000 in the past year. And they're more disconnected socially. So they report economic um, distress. They're more likely to be living alone. So the ones who are downloading mobile are less likely to be in a household with somebody else. They're less likely to attend religious services. And they're much less likely to be married, something I'll talk about in a bit more detail in the past. So it's importantly, however, they're not Southern and they're not rural. These are not people who are concentrated in the South. They're not people who are concentrated in, in Appalachia or in rural areas. This is a national po population that we're seeing. An important fact I will come back to again. So they're more likely to be in urban areas, more likely to be in urban areas than the better off. They're similar in similar regions of the country and similar ages. Um, and so they are um, not Southern, not rural, but recording a lot of economic distress and also um, having uh, other characteristics um, that we would associate with that distress. They identify with a lower social class, summing up. They're economically disadvantaged. They're socially disconnected. They're distributed, distributed across the nation. These are the people who say, I'm doing worse. I'm downwardly mobile, the least happy. The ones who tell you that they're lower class. And here's how I think their attitudes in 2014 foreshadowed the Trump campaign. Now, I'm getting all these questions from a 2014 survey, okay? This is 2016. I can't determine whether these people voted for Trump or even what they were thinking. But luckily, the 2014 survey asked lots of questions that get right to the issues which came to the fore in the Trump campaign. And when you compare the worse off, better off, the upwardly mobile, downwardly mobile, you see very large differences in their attitudes toward the kinds of issues we've been talking about over the last several months. For example, there's a question in the general social survey, do you think that the number of immigrants nowadays, nowadays is the kind of word that Nork uses, maybe Tronk too, although I've never heard a human being actually pronounce it until now, nowadays should be responding, this is the person who say they should be reduced a little or a lot. There are a lot of options there, more, same, reduced. These are the percent of people who think the number of immigrants nowadays should be reduced. For the ones who say I'm doing better than my parents, 46%. For the ones who are saying, I'm doing about the same as my parents, 49%. For the worse off, 69%. So they're substantially more likely to say we've got too many immigrants in this country. They're also asked if immigrants take jobs away from Americans. And this is the percent who say, I agree. The better off, about a third say immigrants take jobs away from Americans. A bit more for those who say, I'm doing about as well as my parents. Nearly half of those who say I'm doing worse off. So in terms of attitudes toward immigration, there's a sh sharp break here that follows this division between people who think their lives are better and people who think their lives are worse than what they expected to be happening in their lives. And there are other ways in which they seem to break uh, toward it, Trump issues. There was another question in this survey that said, how proud of you, of the, how proud of you, how, sorry, how proud, proud are you of America in the way democracy works? Given pride and patriotism, when you ask a question like this, how proud are you in American democracy? People tend to say, I'm pretty proud, okay? They don't like to tell you they're not proud of America. So these are the percent, however, who said they're not very proud or not proud at all. About a quarter of the better off, a bit more of the same, but more of the worse off. So the worse off are more likely to tell you that they're not proud of the way democracy is happening in America today. You could say things are rigged. You could say it's all rigged against us. We're not proud of how this works. You could say that, especially if you've lost all your faith in institutions, which this group seems to have come close to doing also. 
Um, there were a number of questions about trust in institutions asked in this survey. And uh, here are four such institutions, Congress, banks and financial institutions, the education system, and major companies. And I'm going to show you two lines, a red line for the worse off and a blue line for the better off. For Congress, the worse off are more likely to say they have hardly any confidence in Congress. And it turns out nobody has much confidence in Congress, but the worse off, even less. They have less faith in banks and financial institutions. The red line is larger than the blue line. They have less faith in education systems, such as the one we're sitting in. And they have less faith in major companies. In fact, through a whole series of questions about trust in institutions and faith in institutions, the people who think they're not doing as well as their parents have, have much less confidence. They also project that onto their children. Finally, another question says, when your children are the same age you are now, do you think their standard of living will be better or worse? This is the percent saying, my children will be doing worse. Only about 16% of the better off think their children will be doing worse. A quarter of the same, a third of the worse off. So across a number of indicators, you see a group which thinks there are too many immigrants in this country. They take jobs away, not proud of the way American works. America works, does not have faith and trust in institutions, just the kind of person who might be susceptible to the issues that the Trump campaign is raising. So who are the worse off whites? To the list I gave you before, I want to add that they seem primed in 2014 to be receptive to Trump's 2016 campaign themes. Can't tell you for sure, it's just a 2014 survey, but they certainly seem like the group which would resonate to the themes of the Trump campaign. How might they be reached in the future? Let's think after the election. Suppose we want to try to appeal to those who have reached them, help them, bring them back more into the mainstream, give them some more trust in institutions. How might we do that? Much of what I want to talk about from now on in the talk is about that question. And when I thought about that question, I asked myself, are these people politically conservative? Um, is the worse off group, the people that says they're downwardly mobile, are they more politically conservative than the better off group? You would think so. They're really unhappy. They don't like institutions. They don't seem to like immigrants, but you would be wrong. Actually, they're not more politically conservative. They're more likely to have voted for Obama in 2012, not by much, but let's say virtually equal amounts of the better off and the worse off people voted for Obama. They're more likely to describe themselves as liberal. Now, almost nobody does, but the worse off are somewhat more likely to describe, them as describe themselves as liberal. They're less likely to agree that government should provide no special treatment to African Americans. And when we hear from this, this campaign now of, of a resistance to assistance for African Americans, at least in a survey, they don't seem opposed, more opposed to, to helping African Americans. And they're more likely to agree that government in Washington should do everything possible to improve the standards of living of the poor. 31% of the worse off versus 19% of the better off. They seem then to accept the idea of government action more so than the people who are doing better. Now you might say, well, if they're not politically conservative, they certainly should be socially conservative. So let's look at that. Are they more socially conservative than the white better off group? Well, in fact, they're more likely to think that the courts are too harsh in dealing with criminals. Not less likely, but more likely to think the courts are too harsh. That's not socially conservative. They're slightly more likely to agree that it should be possible for a pregnant woman to obtain a legal abortion if she wants one for any reason. They're not more pro-life. They're just as likely to agree that a working mother doesn't hurt children. And so they're not more socially conservative according to these, these questions. Now, I didn't expect those findings when I, when I began to look at this data. And whenever I'm analyzing survey data and doing tables, and I find a set of responses that I don't, didn't expect, I never know whether to believe them, okay? Are there just a few crazy people in this 2014 sample who are uh, skewing it in ways I didn't expect? So I tried to find someone who was doing some work in the trenches on um, the white working class. And in fact, I have a, a good friend who is. Her name is Jennifer Silva. 
She's a sociologist at Bucknell University. She did all of the qualitative interviews for Robert Putnam's book, Our Kids. And she herself has written a good book about working class young adults called Coming Up Short, Working Class Adulthood in an Age of Uncertainty. And because she's now at Bucknell, which is in Pennsylvania coal country, she's doing an ethnographic study of the whites in Pennsylvania coal country. Um, and so I said to her, Jen, what do they say about the Tea Party in Pennsylvania coal country? She said, nothing. Nobody ever mentions the Tea Party. I said, what about social issues? She said, they're fine with gay marriage. Nobody has a problem with gay marriage. Uh, they're not particularly pro-life. Um, uh, so they're not Tea Party supporters, okay? They're not, and, and, and one more point she said, they seem to accept the idea that government ought to help people. They might think that help is going to the wrong people right now, but the idea that government should do something is something they accept. So they're not Tea Party people. They're not like those Louisiana people that Arlie Hochschild is finding who hate government, who are strongly pro-life, who are values voters, who vote to support their values, which they strongly feel. They do not appear to be those kinds of people. They might be susceptible to, to the arguments of a Trump, but they don't seem to be Tea Partiers. And they're not standard social or political conservatives. I think this is very interesting because it suggests that perhaps you could reach them by economic policies. That is to say, one doesn't have to change their views on abortion to reach them. One doesn't have to convince them that government should do something to reach them. Um, one doesn't have to convince them that the, the, the anti-government stance of the Tea Party needs modifications to reach them. And so, as I'll mention a bit more, it seems to me that there's an opportunity to actually help them reach them, bring them more into the mainstream. But first, another point about the worse off. As I said, I study families. And the most striking difference I saw in the difference between better off and worse off people, whites is that the worse off are much less likely to be married. Here's a chart for men in the 2014 General Social Survey. Again, I have these same three groups of non-college educated whites, those who say I'm upwardly mobile, same downwardly mobile. Among those who said they're better off, 72% of those men were married. Among those who said I'm doing about the same as my parents, 49% were married. Among those who said I'm worse off, 27% were married. There's an enormous difference here in marriage probabilities, suggesting a tremendously different kind of family life is occurring among the people who think they're the downly mobile. Um, now, why should we care about marriage? Well. If I were giving this talk in Scandinavia, I would not care about marriage so much because they have long-term cohabiting relationships that last for decades and are pretty much equivalent to marriage. And sometimes they get married 15, 20 years after they started their relationship. Same in France, even a bit in the UK, but not here. Here in the US, our living together relationships are short-term. People live together outside of marriage for one, two, or three years, and they either break up or they get married. And increasingly these days, they break up. So we should care about marriage because we care about stable family lives, especially for the children involved in these families. That's really what motivates me is the well-being of the children in these families. That's why I study families. And I think that I care about marriage in the US context because that's how Americans do stable relationships. They get married. And until that changes, and I've been waiting for decades for it to change, and it has not changed yet, Marriage is the way they do it. So the huge differences in marriage are, are me quite consequential for the lives of children in these families. And there is a huge social class gap in marriage these days. This is the percentage of all US adults in their 40s and 50s who are currently in a first marriage, all national sample. Among those without a high, without a high school degree, 31% are currently married. Goes up to 42% for those with a high school degree. Doesn't go up much at all for those with a bit of college, but is 61% for those with a bachelor's degree. A two to one ratio, 31% to 61%. College educated people in their 40s and 50s are twice as likely to be currently married as people with the least education. This class gap in marriage is new in America in the last half century. 
you would not have seen this in the mid 20th century. Everybody was married in the mid 20th century. Poor people were married in the mid 20th century. Middle class people and wealthy people were married. There was no real distinction. But today we're doing a sort, a sort in which the college educated are much more likely to be married than are everybody else. In fact, if there is a social class line in America that involves family life, it is between the college educated and everybody else. The college educated who seem to be the ones in the more privileged sector of, of our economy, we're poor, pooling two incomes, marrying and making a go of it. So there is a huge social class gap in marriage. We're also concerned about uh, non-marital births. We used to call it out of wedlock childbearing. Um, and we're compared, concerned about that because of stability again and because of a research done by IPR um, faculty such as David, which is informing us about family instability and family structure and education and how it might affect um, uh, boys and girls in low-income families. I want to talk with you a bit about the percentage of women who have non-marital births, as I'll call it, because our whole idea of who those women are has really changed over the last few decades. Um, in 1990 to 1995, this is the percent of women who had a non-marital birth. In other words, of all the women who are giving birth, how many are not married? And not surprisingly, it's highest for people with the least education, and it goes down. 15 years later, it has the same slope, but the, the, the bars are much higher. What you see is an increase for everybody in the proportion who are having non-marital births. But the increase is not greatest at the bottom. It's greatest for, these, greatest for these people and these people, the people with moderate education. In other words, the growth in non-marital childbearing over the last 10, 15, 20 years, has been largely in this moderately educated group that we're kind of calling the working class. It's not been in the poorest. It's been in the group that is in the high school educated working class that we've seen the largest increases in non-marital childbearing. This is why it connects up with the story of the working class. Um, in addition, there are two different ways you can be a, a, a mother who is unmarried at birth. You can be cohabiting with a partner, or you can be a lone person, a single mother without a partner. And I want to show you how that distribution has changed a lot over the last 30 years, and how that forces us to think quite differently about so-called non-marital childbearing. So this is the percentage of births to single and cohabiting mothers under age 40 over a long time period. In the early 1980s, about 15% of all women, women who gave birth were single, that is, they had no partner. Another six were living together, giving us a total of 21 out of every 100 women who gave birth were unmarried. 10 years later, not much increase in the percentage of births to single mothers, alone mothers, but an increase in the births to cohabiting mothers. Add those two numbers up and you get 27% of all births to unmarried mothers, births to mothers are unmarried. A few years later, <clears throat> not much increase again in births to single parents, but another big increase in births to cohabiting parents, which now for the first time exceed single mothers in the total of 35 out of every 100 births that are now outside of marriage. Going into the 2000s, no change in the percentage of births to single mothers, but yet another increase in births to cohabiting mothers. Add those two numbers up and you get 40% of all births are to non-married mothers. And in the most recent period, another small increase of single moms, an increase in cohabiting moms, giving 43%. So you see that those bottom bars, the bottom section of each bars, which show you the, the, the non-marital childbearing among Single women have hardly increased over the last 30 years. It's from 15 to 18 percent, but there's been a huge increase in cohabiting mothers. So the, the clear majority of all unmarried births, out of wedlock births now, are to cohabiting mothers. So a few takeaways now about unmarried parenthood and its connection up with the working class. So most of the increase in non-marital births out of wedlock childbearing, if you want to use that term, since 1980 has been in births to cohabiting couples. They're not married, that's, you know, that's non-married childbearing, not single moms. 
Secondly, the greatest percentage increases have occurred among mothers with a moderate level of education, the so-called working class, not the bottom. This forces us to change the way we think about out of wedlock childbearing. 20 or 30 years ago, when people started, when I started studying this, if you ask someone quickly for a picture of a teen, of an unmarried uh, a mother, you'd get a picture of in your head of a teenage mom, probably minority group, living with a grandmother. That was a stereotype, but relatively accurate back then. Now, if you want a stereotype, it's a 20-something-year-old person living with her partner, probably white. That's the growth. And who have been, where's that growth been consecrated, concentrated? The very people in the working class who find themselves in a position where they can't, all of them, have the standard of living they wish. Instead of having children in marriage, they're having children outside. So um, what's behind all this births in non-marital, uh, this rise in non-marital births to the working class? Is it all cultural? There are some people, though not many, who claim that there's been such a decline in values about marriage that people just don't care anymore, and that's why they're not getting married. But surveys show that most everybody would like to get married, even the people who don't. But they see, because of research done again by, by some people in this room even, um, they say that they won't get married until the conditions are right, until they have the economic wherewithal to make a marriage last. Until then, they'll live with somebody, and increasingly now they'll actually go ahead and have a kid, but they won't get married. So it's not all cultural. Um, it, is, it is in some respect, I think, a response to poor labor market opportunities for the working class. Why do I think that? Well, uh, with a couple of people, I, took an, I did an investigation of whether the availability of what I'm calling middle skilled jobs in your local labor market made a difference in whether you marry before you have a kid. Um, using in an article that was published in August in the American Sociological Review with my two collaborators, we used a data set uh, uh, which is collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics called the National Longitudinal Surveys. Our particular data set was about 9,000 individuals who were born in the early 1980s, and in 1997, when they were young teenagers, the Bureau of Labor Statistics started interviewing this national sample, and they've interviewed them ever since. And we're using information through 2011 when they were in their late 20s. And by that time, most of the non-marital childbearing that this group was going to do had happened, because people who have a child outside of marriage tend to have it early on. So as we did this, we, we followed all these 9,000 people statistically, and we added to their records information on the extent to which there were jobs in their local labor market that tended to hire high school grads and that paid above poverty wages. Um, and what we found was that men who lived in areas with more of these middle-skilled jobs, the kind of jobs a high school-educated guy can get, were more likely to marry prior to a first birth. And women in areas with more middle-skilled jobs were not only more likely to marry, but more likely to cohabit while having a first birth. So it appears that the availability of these kinds of jobs encourages marriage prior to first birth. Now, I will be happy to talk with the social scientists in the room about important issues of statistical modeling and identification and so forth, but I'm not going to do that right now, okay? <laughs> um, right now, I'm going to say, given the limitations that any paper has, we have some evidence that, in fact, if where there are better jobs available for this moderate educated group, marriage is more common. So what's behind the rise in non-marital births to the working class? One factor, then, is a decline in jobs for high school graduates that pay above poverty wages. This is a decline that's occurred as the result of globalization and automation. What we've seen is a movement of jobs overseas or into computer chips that has really narrowed the job market um, for people in the middle of the labor force. And certainly David is an expert on this, um, such that the opportunities for people with a moderate amount of education are much more constricted, relatively speaking, than they should. In common terms, the factories have moved away. In Baltimore, we used to have a General Motors assembly plant. It paid, uh, paid um, unionized wages. It employed 8,000 people. It was shut down. 
bulldoze, and now it's an Amazon.com distribution center, okay? Employs 1,000 people, they get paid 11 or $12 an hour. And you know what? That is a good job, and thousands of Baltimore residents tried very hard to get it. That's the difference for the moderately educated. So putting all this together, the economy, the family, and working class discontent, within the white working class, I would maintain, what matters for Trump-like issues is how adults feel about their standard of living compared to the lives their parents led. Not just how much money you're making, but how much you thought you would make. Not what job you have, but what job you thought you would have. That's what matters. And that the most distressed about their standard of living, and I believe the most Trump issue friendly, are not the most politically or socially conservatives. They've experienced economic distress, but they're not Tea Party supporters. They don't live in Appalachia. They're not a group of evangelicals in Oklahoma. They are not politically or socially conservative, but they are aggrieved, alienated, and profoundly distrustful and much less likely to have stable social ties, especially men who seem to be floating away from the rest of society, living alone, not going to church, not being married, drifting away from the college-educated middle class. I would argue that this is therefore an economic issue, although culture matters, okay? It is a result of the trends we've seen in globalization and automation. Uh, culture certainly matters. I'll give you a great example. In the 1930s, in the Great Depression, the economy was terrible, but there were no children born outside of marriage. Well, maybe a few. Because it was unacceptable to have a child outside of marriage. There's almost nobody living in sin without being married, as my parents would have called it, because it wasn't acceptable to cohabit. So sure, culture matters, and the greater acceptance today of living together outside of marriage and of having children outside of marriage is part of this, but it's part of this that is enacted upon because of the economic change we have seen, profound. Second lesson I would draw is all Trump issue supporters are not alike. I think this is an important lesson for us as we think about this election and after it ends as we think about what we just saw. They're not a homogeneous group. There are different parts of them and they should be treated differently, at least in our sense of how one might want to talk with them, reach them, help them. This is also a national, not a regional phenomenon. The working class whites I'm talking about are distributed around the country. Some observers have said what we've seen here is not a regional, but an educational uh, uh, stratification. It's education that now makes the difference, not which part of the, of the nation you are in. They have strong feelings, these people who think they're doing worse off than their parents. But they're not values voters. They're not strongly pro-life. Gay marriage is fine. Government, you may have some problems with it, but you recognize the point that government does have a role to play. I think this is important because I think it's much easier to change feelings than values. It's much easier to change my feeling about how I'm doing in my life relative to my parents than it is to convince me that abortion is wrong or that abortion is right or that marriage is for a man and a woman. Okay? Feelings are easier to change than values, and if it's feelings that's driving this, this discontent, we may have a shot at dealing with it. We may find that, we, that this group could respond to changes in economic and educational policies. The Tea Party people in Louisiana are not really going to respond to that. Um, Arlie Hochschild finds that she goes to a town where there's been horrible environmental pollution that's poisoned all the bayous because of some chemical companies, and yet the people she talks to are anti-environmental protection agency people. They hate the EPA because it's government, it's regulation, even as they can barely use their property because of the pollution. It's hard to change that. It's easier to change feelings about how one's life is going. So I think that this suggests that we could potentially do something to bring the working class back into the mainstream. That is, most importantly, we can improve the situation of people in the middle of the labor market. I do not, I, I do not um, for sure suggest that this is easy to do, that we have it figured out. It's really difficult. 
But there are some things we can do. There are some jobs in the middle of the labor market. There are some jobs that someone can get with a couple of years of college that pay decently. Um, emergency medical technicians, for example, EMTs. Really good job, pays pretty well. Um, needed a bit of need a bit of education. You don't need a college degree. All kinds of medical technicians. Um, People operating c computer numerically controlled machines, which now are doing much of the production in our factories, which are actually, which are actually producing more than they used to, but with far fewer workers. Um, institutional supports, such as raising the minimum wage, there's a dispute among economists as well as politicians about how far you could do that. Clearly, if I raise the minimum wage to $100 an hour, it's going to have very bad effects on hiring. But could it be raised a bit? Okay, could it be raised some to 10, 12, or some people think 15? At what point might we be able to, what point might we be able to raise it and provide more for these folks? Might we be able to extend the earned income tax credit, a, a subsidy, wage subsidy to childless workers, not just people raising children in a way that would kind of subsidize the wages of men? So there are some things we could do without at all minimizing the difficulties of them. Things that we could do potentially to reach a part of the Trump supporters, a part that is not the same as the Tea Party, Midwest, Appalachian wing we think of, a part that is responding to economics, I would argue, not to social value change. And we could do some work to connect them and to connect these people and make them less disconnected. Thanks for listening to me.